Welcome to the Origin Canine Podcast, where we speak to authentic and inspiring voices from the working canine world. Listen to this episode, subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media, and go to origincanine.com. Enjoy the show. All right, g'day guys. Welcome to the Origin Canine Podcast. Uh, so today we've got Mike Jones uh, from the USA. Um, you might know Mike from Primal Canine, uh, Canine Street League. You're obviously paired with big companies like Ray Allen, um, and you're obviously a prolific serial offender decoy. Um, so, mate, welcome to the show. Thanks, bro. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. I you know, really appreciate it. No, nah, mate, I, like, I forgot if I said before the, the show, but, like, I appreciate your time, man. Like, I know you're a busy dude. So, yeah, thank you, bro. Uh, yeah, no, my, my bad for being a little late. I got these for nah, the nah, dogs. No, so. <laughs> no, nah, nah, dude, I, I know, like, We've all got our own little businesses, man, and, and we're not, you know, we're not clocks that constantly run on the on the, on the fucking time, so it's all good. Um, hey, dude, so I don't know if you've heard the show or anything. Normally, I'll just go over things like your childhood growing up and then influences getting into the dog world, man. So, um, yeah, if you just want to hit us with your childhood, like, where do you grow up and, and what was childhood like for you? Cool. Yeah, so I I grew up in um, Eastside San Jose. Uh, for those who aren't really aware of that, it's like so. It's in San, it's in California, uh, the Bay Area, um, and San Jose. I believe is like one of the largest cities in the United States still. Um, but I grew up in the east side of it, which is you know essentially the hood um, of it. You know, I'm 39 years old, so back then it was even crazier than it is now. Um, so I grew up in a pretty. <laughs> I grew up really poor. Um, you know, my mom was a single mother. Uh, we lived with her, her family. Um, and her family was crazy. You know, her dad was a crazy alcoholic. Uh, my aunts and uncles and everyone that kind of went through there hated my mom. So they were constantly fighting. My mom and I shared like a one bed, like a, my office I'm in right now is bigger than uh, the room I grew up in until I was 11. <laughs> 11 until my mom was able to hustle her way out and get us out of that house. Um, but the, the house I grew up in was very chaotic, tons of physical violence, you know, a lot of problems constantly happening um you know lots of drugs and stuff going around so i spent a lot of my time you know on the streets uh you know there's a, a shirt that we made uh with omerta a collaboration we did with them um they said like a uh, raised on or was it born in the streets raised by wolves that street uh, that shirt was based off of my upbringing because uh in east side san jose like when you're one of my friends you know we just like ride our skateboards around or you know ride bikes or whatever it may be around the neighborhood and there's like constantly like dogs just in the front yard and occasionally, you know, they break out. So I was constantly either trying to make friends with the ones that didn't want to bite me or run from the ones that did want to bite me at a very young age. And that's when I kind of started like, I don't know. I don't want to say I didn't never, I never noticed that I had something with dogs until I got older. Um, Cause when I was younger, that was just a part of life, you know, was go outside you know, avoid the conflict that was going on inside the house uh, or around the house and then just kind of hang out with friends and cruise around the neighborhood I mean, you know, make dog friends. And my life kind of just went on um, and it was, it kind of followed in the, the normal path of, you know, people like me who came from where I came from, you know, like getting in trouble, lots of fights, uh, wasn't really excelling in, you know, general school. Uh, I got in trouble. I ended up having to do some community service work and, you know, ironically, or the, I guess, you know, it would be, I don't know if it's ironic, it's a proper word, but luckily for me, I ended up doing like uh, community service work with like the shelter uh, with dogs. So I was able to learn a lot about, you know, dogs in the shelter. And I, I, I at the beginning, I learned, you know, basically what everyone learns in the shelter. It's like, you know, treat based training, all that stuff, which I thought was cool because I just got to hang out with dogs and make friends. So yeah. my life kind of just continued to go on uh, through my teenage years. You know, we end, I ended up getting like this, like German shepherd mix that I uh, rescued. Like literally, like when people say rescue, like I actually rescued this puppy. Like I was about to get hit by a car and I ran in the middle of the street and grabbed this thing, uh, her and her brother. And I gave her, my cousin took one and then I took uh, her, her name was Kiona. And then uh, life kind of went on again. I got into, you know, boxing uh, pretty heavily uh, through Pell. And then started boxing for, you know, a long period of time. Uh, got in trouble again uh, once I got out of trouble um, and, you know, came, came out. Uh, I went out and freaking started uh, 
boxing wasn't really like making money. And then I'd, I'd like to sell mixed martial arts. So I got into mixed martial arts, um, started training at Fairtex. And then a friend of my uh, ex-wife, uh, she knew uh, a guy named, by the name of Terry Macias. Terry Macias is like a, a big Schutzen guy. Uh, I wanted I, him and his club, the Sounds German Shepherd Club, they would constantly be in the worlds, you know, you know, doing Schutzen. Uh, so I became a helper uh, for Terry, uh, just kind of helping him with his dogs. Uh, he, you know, he liked it just because of the fact that I, was, I came from combat sports because um, he was a wrestler himself. Uh, so I started learning how to essentially be a helper and shits in. Um, and I knew a lot about, like, you know, I didn't know a lot about dogs, but, like, I knew more than the average person about dogs at that point, just from the training I received um, at the shelter, reading all the books that I read. Because back then, you know, dating myself here, you couldn't go online and, you know, go do a, a, a course or nothing. There was, can't remember, was it, I can't even remember what it was, but then, like, the AOL had the little disc, and then there was that other, like, little disc thing that, like, had, like, a, like an encyclopedia thing on it. And like I did all my like learning on there or went to the library when people still go to the library, library and yeah, like yeah. got books, <laughs> did that, um, read a bunch of stuff on dogs. And then, you know, when I went to uh, learn from Terry in Schutzen in like my early twenties, like 21, 22, uh, I started to learn, you know, a lot about like drive building, the different drives, you know, I was amazed cause I went from this whole thing where it's like working from treats, uh, you know, treats and food and, you know, doing these things like, you know, kind of, I don't want to say purely positive, but like, you know, like the positive, it was, I was never, when I learned that style, it was never like, oh, this is the only way to do it. It was just the lady that taught me and I, for the life of me, can't remember her name. Um, she was never like, you know, like sometimes positive reinforcement people are a little bit, like a little bit of spun up type of a thing. Like not all of them, I'm not saying like, you know, but you know, some of them are a little bit, no, this is the only way you're the devil if you do this to a dog type of a thing. Yeah. If you don't have She wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, she wasn't like that. She she was just like, this is the one way. So then I went to, um, you know, Schutzen when it was still called Schutzen and prong, <laughs> prong colors, like, you know, things of that nature. And I was like, holy crap, what is this? And this is like interesting. Like I had pit bulls at the time. So like it was, uh, you know, this is when like Schutzen, like you couldn't do like the, the pits couldn't even go and train or do anything like that. I would just like lay tracks, do some helper work. I just learned a bunch of things in there. Um, uh, and then, you know, life kind of just took its place, man. You know, took its way. I, I kind of st- kept working with dogs always. You know, I'd volunteer my time at shelters or the daycares that my dogs would be at, just kind of helping helping out wherever I could. Uh, and then I opened a, a gym with my brother-in-law. Uh, we did, uh, like, any, you know, jiu-jitsu, mixed martial arts, or what they called it, panjo, uh, kickboxing, wrestling, doing those things. I had a, a job as a marketing director for an office furniture company. So I did those two things and then volunteered some time. Uh, and then uh, he, he ended up, my ex brother in law adopting a dog named bear. This is the guy that's tattooed on my hand. Uh, I really wanted a dog. And then my ex wife was like, nah, no dogs. Da-da, no more dogs. I already had Marilyn. And I was just like, all right. I was like, well, I, I, I was like, whatever. It's like, you know, I'll get another dog some other time. And then he ended up adopting the dog, but secretly adopted the dog uh, to give to me. So <laughs> they surprised me with the dog. He ended up getting a, a training package with the trainer and I went to, you know, went with him to go to the, to go train. And I was just like, I didn't think that at that time, I didn't think dog training was really like a business, you know, like it was like, I wasn't thinking like, Oh, this is like a, you know, something I can do. And especially like at the time, the, the person I was with really didn't think that was a business or a job. So I was like, okay, this can't, can't be that. And, I started really thinking about it with like pricing and all that other stuff. Cause you know, I'm not too sure if it's the same way over there, but like, you know, sport clubs, you're not, you're not paying a ton of money, you know, for your, your club fee. Right. So I'm like, okay, that that's not a sustainable living, especially we're living where we lived in California. So then I started seeing like, Oh, this seen it more as a business. This is what people are paying. And it made sense to me because of the amount of like years and stuff it took me to learn everything I learned. It made sense to me that, you know, you would charge that much money because it's similar to going to college for any other profession, right? Like you spend this money, you take this time to learn these skill sets, and then you go out to the field and you, 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 you work. So it made sense. Um, so I talked to my brother-in-law, I was talking to a couple other people and, uh, realistically it was the guy at the, the kennel, Springdale kennel, his name was Jeff. Uh, he's like, man, he's like, he's like, just quit your job. He's like, and just start training dogs. He's like, just just do that. So I didn't quit my job because I had mortgage to pay for. But uh, I started the whole, you know, Mike Jones, uh, 
dog psychology, dog training thing for a couple years. And then, uh, I had, a I what I had a, like a personal training, uh, company called uh, the primal workout, which is like, we basically bunch, we basically put a bunch of like normal, basically body movements, like functional movements and, you know, worked on strength training for that. And I, I, I liked the name primal, um, when I first did it. And then for that one, I was like, man, I was like, let's just do like primal canine. Cause it, it was originally based off of the original way, like that we, you know, we got domesticated dogs, like the root. That's what the whole people think when they hear primal canine, they see the teeth and it's red, it's all aggressive. But in reality, it's like, it was just based on the relationship we had with dogs when we first, you know, domesticated them, and, you know, the, the root, right. That's what it kind of, for me, that's what it meant. So, you know, start your primal canine and 11 something years later, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh it's primal canine itself i mean shit man we could talk for like hours on on that journey on this journey that primal canine has been because you know when, when i first started it was you know we started in that the rescue spring not the rescue at the uh the kennel springdale kennels and i was just borrowing time you know helping them with the dogs that were just getting dropped off there and uh that were people were just abandoning so we would train them and then help them get adopted again and then I'll do that so I can use the yard for some training. And then, uh, excuse me. And then, um, we, we outgrew that real quickly. Got like a tiny little tin shack called the cave. Uh, I grew that real quickly, got another spot. Um, and then they started to gentrify the area that we were in. So then that spot got pretty like destroyed. Like the, they, they basically tore down a bunch of old buildings cause we were in these warehouses. And then, uh, like where they turned on the buildings, like it started, like all the rats and stuff started coming out. So then we started getting some in our facility and immediately I told our landlord, Hey, like, we got to get out of here like this, or you got to do something about it. They didn't do anything. So we immediately shut down and moved. And, uh, at that point with primal canine, we were, we were pretty like, we I mean 50, 60 dogs a month, um, in training and then not including boarding trains. And I had, at the time I had a a rescue called the free dogs foundation where we took in all the uh, euthanization cases. So I had a bunch of dogs who were potentially dangerous. I had to come with me like tons of things. So we got this giant property in a, a city called Campbell in uh, the Bay area, which is a very nice uh, area. And then things we, what happened was, uh, what happened was uh, we pulled into this area. We painted the building black. Cause if you guys don't know, like our branding is usually black, white, and red. Uh, so we, we painted this building black, beautiful place. And I started moving kennels there. I, I get home to like this, uh, apartment that my, I was living in at the time. And I believe my wife now, Aaron was with me. I think she, I think she just moved there. Cause I, I got, I was sick in this whole entire time too. I got, I got diagnosed with cancer throughout this move. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. I told you, man, this could be, this would be a long story, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But uh, we were we were like sick and so I was sick and then we were at the apartment or something, and the guy calls me Sergeant Jenkins. I, I knew Jenkins uh, from Animal Control for a long long time just because of you know Primal Canine and my history of dog training in San Jose. He's like, hey Mike. He's like, um, I'm sure you know. He's like, you're, you're getting complaints about barking at your new place, and I just told him, I was like, hey Jason. I was like, uh, we're not even there. I was like the painters are there and like we move some stuff. I was like, we're not even there yet. Uh, and then he's like, really? He's like, yeah. So they're complaining about your dogs are barking now. I was like, I, he's like, I'll FaceTime you, man. Like we're like, I have dogs in my apartment and like, they're still at the other place. I was like, there's no one there. So already we knew something was going to go on. Cause I mean, the area itself was, it's really like posh, you know, kind of what we were talking about earlier, that other side, like <laughs> that, that, uh, that other side of people. Um, and like, you know, I drove, you know, big black truck, I'm a heavily tattooed bearded guy at pit bulls and, you know, some Malinois and that area probably didn't take too kind to me, um, showing up there, even though like all I really wanted to do was kind of provide a good service, like, you know, and just help people out in that area. Cause in Campbell, there's a lot of dogs. So we get over there and I want to say within two or three months, we, uh, we were basically told that we weren't able to operate and at that facility. And I, I, at, 
I can be a little rebellious at that time. So I, I just kept, <laughs> I just kept operating. Um, and we went to, we, we didn't go to court. We went to like a, we ended up going to city hall. We, we ended up talking to the people that ran, uh, the city, everything like that. Santa Clara County had a great turnout from, you know, clients of ours, people who are supporters of ours and, <clears throat> and the story, like, no matter what they heard, no matter how many, how many stories were told of how we're actually trying to do these things and our appearance wasn't really what it is. And like, we're trying to be nice people, like we're nice people. We help a lot of dogs. Uh, they just revoked our, really revoked our ability to work there. So that we ended up having to move, which cost us quite a bit of money. And uh, it's just, it was, it was tough too, because, you know, our, our whole thing at Primal Canine is we don't turn away dogs. Like we will work with, whatever behavioral case you have youth cases we have never turned away a dog ever out of my 11 close over out of let's say it's 14 years of being a professional dog trainer like taking money i have never turned a dog away like not a single one anywhere from i don't even know doubt that tens of thousands of dogs i've trained already uh, we've dealt with some pretty crazy cases and we've never turned one away so, I mean, a lot of dogs uh, suffered uh, during that, especially the dogs that uh, were part of our Free Dogs Foundation. We actually had to shut down that um, that rescue and try to place some homes. And the crazy part about it is we placed them with people that we thought that we could trust and everything like that, but they ended up being a little more snaky than anticipated. So we ended up uh, moving from the, the Bay Area, which is that San Jose area, uh, to uh, a city called Morgan Hill, which is about 10, 15 minutes. It's actually the city I live in now, the, where I live up, up in the hills. And we got this like warehouse, a uh, really cool spot, uh, brand new. We were literally the first people in it. <laughs> and a similar thing happened. Uh, we get everything all pretty, make it all nice. And the city rezoned us. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, because at that point in time, we were doing, it's, I don't, I think what happened is because we during this whole time thing that was happening since the first time I started Primal Canine, we had a film crew with us uh, because I'm not too sure if you're how familiar with like mixed martial arts, but like a, there's a guy named a MMA fighter. Uh, he's a veteran now uh, named Kung Lee. Uh, he was I trained his dog Coda, and he he at the time was like filming TV shows left and right. Like he was doing a bunch of different things, and he wanted to do a show uh, with us. Cause he was just like really fascinated with the training and, you know, protection stuff and the rescue thing. So, uh, we had a film crew with us this whole entire time for years. They would intermittently show up, film things. And they started posting like videos of us doing protection work and using like not as quote unquote aggressive songs, but a little more like songs you would listen to in the gym to go lift heavy things or, or go yeah, run stuff. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah just things like that. So it's like on Instagram and, People see like the protection work, they see us and they see the you know, black and red primal canine and it looked aggressive and I totally get it. You know, uh, you know, I look aggressive, I guess. I mean, it's just my face, but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so they, they ended up rezoning us. That was like, fine. We ended up getting to Gilroy, uh, and Gilroy took us in. Uh, they were super, yeah, still very appreciative to this uh, community out here in Gilroy. Got up to Gilroy. We got like a ranch property uh, just for the time being until we could find um, this like little little uh, spot that we had. It used to be a tattoo shop. We got in there. Uh, had to get a bigger spot because we were growing. And that's like the big place, the, the big warehouse you guys see online uh, with the turf inside. We got that place a couple years back. Um, fitted it out. I kept the other place until recently. Now we're expanding into the big, the big spot now because we had a day training spot at the little one. And yeah, man, that brings it to kind of present time. I mean, there's a there's a ton of little intricacies here and there. You know, we can talk about like the partnership with Ray Allen um, that we started with them. Um, you know, the suits, the incogs, the all the harnesses, collars that we've designed and done R and D for. Um, you know, partnerships with Omerta, Street League. I mean this new tequila that we just launched <laughs> the fight workshops. I mean, there, where's uh there's quite a bit of uh stuff, but I mean, I, I wouldn't say that's the, the short side of it, but that's as about as short as I can condense uh, my life up until now. 
All right, guys, thanks for having Mike on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. That was good, man. That was, that was like everything. All right, because there's a bunch of stuff, man, that I want to pick out of that, dude. Um, a lot of childhood stuff, and there's a bunch of stuff that you mentioned, and then some stuff we're talking about off air, obviously. Um, Matt, have you... Not, not to be facetious or anything, have you ever been diagnosed with anything like ADHD or, or ADD or anything like that, or...? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And look, the, I'll put no. some context to that. I just got diagnosed myself the other day because I've um, – you're like a serial entrepreneur, man. You're just a guy that is like, hey, let's just do this, let's do this, let's do this. So you, you're obviously like an extremely driven guy with a high capacity for work. Um, and that type of behavior, that type of drive, that type of like – you know, business-minded entrepreneur is often associated with people with ADHD and, and some similar sort of conditions. So, because um, I was talking to Mike Nesbeth, uh, Mike Nesbeth that, about it. He was talking about he got diagnosed with um, Asperger's and that, for him, makes him laser focus on things. So I was just curious. Nesbeth, I love, I love that guy. He's a he's an instructor on the Canaan University, the, one of our other businesses. The dude's awesome. Yeah, no, he was a great chat. Yeah, yeah, that and the like the Asperger stuff fascinated me too, man. Like, but um, but anyway, yeah, that was why I was asking, man, just because you're obviously like, you've just done a lot of stuff in your life. I thought it was just because I was born really poor, and I just don't want to be poor again, so I just keep working, <laughs> and, and I got a daughter and a wife to take care of, so I just thought it was that. It could be, man. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no need to put a label on it, but I'm just curious, but. More, more amazing than you. Um, yeah. But, dude, I, I want to hit up some stuff in your childhood. So you said you grew up in San Jose, East California, so inland from the coast. Now, you're 39, so we're talking like mid to late 90s in your formative years, early 2000s. Are we talking like Compton kind of area? Like put this in, in, the, in the context for me. Yeah. Um, for those who probably don't know, like Eastside San Jose – um, yeah, I would say the associations like, you know, East Oakland, Compton, um, East Palo Alto, uh, you know, those are all kind of area. I mean, Compton's obviously LA, uh, but yeah, I mean, shootings, guns, gangs, um, lots of poor people. Um, I mean, there was a lot of stuff. I mean, give you an, I'd give you a kind of, I guess what would be a, so like there, right? I lived here. I lived like in this house. My best friend lived in this house, and there was a house in the middle, right? The house in the middle would have like drive-bys occasionally. So to give you an idea of what would you know type of stuff would go on, you know things of that nature, stabbings. I mean, there was a lot of it was pretty chaotic, like in that area uh, for during the crazier times in the nineties. Um, but yeah, I mean, that just kind of painted a picture. That's kind of what it was like there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. And when you were talking about, like, you know, like the pit bulls and stuff, we're talking, like, that waist-high chain link fence sort of stuff in the front yard, barking at you, that sort of thing. Yep. The, it's the, always, like, the, the funny thing that I would, because, you know, we do a couple of interviews here and there, but um, that's I always tell people, like, the pits were never the ones that scared me. It was those little fucking chihuahuas. Those, <laughs> <laughs> those, those are the ones that can went after us. Yeah. Do you ever get bitten when you were a kid? Yeah, I got snatched up a bunch of times. I don't know. I mean, I can't, like I said, it was running away, or it was mostly skateboarding and bicycling away, or like if you ate shit, then like then we were running away, but like hopping fences. I mean, I I could have sworn this little, I don't even know what type of dog it was. It was just like this mud thing. Like I cleared a couple of fences, got to try to get away from I did get away from it for a little while, and then I wouldn't go around this like corner by our, by this like the house was like around the corner. I just wouldn't go that way for a good month or two. And then finally uh, a friend of mine, Charles, he used to ride his bike to this area that had a little bit, a bunch of dirt jumps. And I was around that corner. I was like, okay, it's been a while. Then he's the dog's not going to be there. Sure enough, that dog was there. And um, I happened to eat shit on my skateboard and yeah, got a nice little, nice little nip on the side of my, <laughs> my leg. But yeah, you know, it's just like most of those dogs, you know, they, they catch you. Then they're like, what do I do here? Or like, they'll just fear bite you or, you know, things of that nature. So it was nothing too crazy. Yeah. So it is. 
Uh, and you're talking about some trouble you got in when you were a kid. What sort of trouble were we talking like with the cops or with some like local gangs or something? No, I got into some. I, you know, I've done some. I've done some time <laughs> a little bit. Uh, lots of fighting. Uh, like I said, I, I grew up really poor, um, and I didn't go to school in that area. I went to my mom got me to go to school where my aunt lit or so like East Side San Jose. And then there's the rest of San Jose, right? There's like, you know, Willow Glen, Northside, a bunch of different things. So I was in East Side San Jose. Um, my aunt had a nice, uh, she lived in a nice part of San Jose because it can go very drastic. It can go from like that Compton esque type of place uh, for people who like don't really know about it. And then they're going to like, you know, you drive down the street or two, you know, let's say four expressways, two expressways down, and you're in like nice places, you know, like million dollar homes, you know, which isn't much in California, but, you know, nice places, people drive nice cars, you don't got to get worried about being robbed or stabbed or shot. You know, it's pretty cool. Like, so I went to schools over there and it kind of started um, young for me. I mean, I went to like a, a my, mom, my mom told me, I think it was like a private, uh, elementary school that I quickly got kicked out of uh some the kids are like picking on me for being poor or whatever and it was like the the kids teacher and this is all stuff my mom would tell me uh and the kid did something to me and then I ended up like punching him in like the face and like got his like messed up his eye and then like I think like a week or two later they like said something to me and I, I stabbed him in the leg with a pencil so then I got I got booted out so I mean it was just one of those things that so, and then it, it would always kind of have that little function. I was very quick to temper, but as I've learned now is my, uh, a lot of the reason why is because that's kind of how things were handled in my household. So I thought that that's kind of how the brain, my brain worked as a kid from what I can self-diagnose. Um, so it was just kind of one of those things where I'd get into fights, get in trouble. When I was younger, it wasn't nothing too crazy. Like, you know, my early 11 till about, Nothing got really, nothing really got too serious until around 16 and then 16, uh, to the time I was in, incarcerated. Um, that's when things got a little bit more serious with just some involvement with, you know, certain people and uh, certain things and, you know, not really, and at the time I was boxing too. So, you know, it's just one of those, what, what do you do? <laughs> I understand why a lot of the reasons why I was, why, like, you know, I went into boxing through PAL, which is a police, a police athletic, uh, league. And, you know, why they wanted me to go into it and why I was like, you know, thriving in that thing. Um, but like, it was the way I would do it now is I would probably consult with somebody who kind of helped me manage the anger a little more back then or help a kid. Like, hey, like, I know you know how to do these things and this is the trigger to go to, but don't do that. <laughs> when the time comes, learn to kind of walk away from the problem. Uh, and I didn't do that one time and it cost me a couple of years. So. Yeah, shit. That was. Do you, yeah. do you want to go through that? Like, what what was the specific incident? And then, mate, give us a rundown. Because the term incarcerated, I'm not sort of, I'm not sure of some of the vernacular over there, but like, jail and prison are they are they different things? Yes. So, like, your jail is like county jail, um, you know, things of that nature, and then prisons like you know state federal state federal state prisons. State prison was that was what I was in. So I actually was got in a lot of trouble. I, was not, I don't want to say too much trouble. I wasn't ever, not necessarily someone looking for trouble, but just from being a kind of a product of my, of my environment and not necessarily having the best leadership. Um, I mean, I, I've been kind of on my own since I would have been like 14. So kind of just going through it, you know, made some associations that I probably shouldn't have made. Uh, and kind of developed a name for myself in that world and then uh i ended up getting jumped by three people three guys uh some serious stuff happened to those guys uh you know two of which were no are no longer around uh one's like in a wheelchair and i ended up going to prison uh and what happened as well and this is part of the problem with our legal system here is that because i had so many other things going on and associations i had and i for me, I'm pretty quiet with things that I do and people I hang around with, especially back then. I didn't really talk about anything. I just kind of took whatever they gave me. And then I ended up, you know, going to prison and there was a lot of evidence that was not brought up 
Um, so we fought appeals for a little about a year and a half, two years. And then finally they released the footage from the actual event where I was jumped by three guys with knives and I defended myself the best way I could. And that's what I told him when I originally got arrested. Uh, Cause that, I mean, even then back then, even, I know I have a tequila now, but like, I didn't, I didn't drink. I was, you know, didn't drink, didn't do drugs, didn't do anything like that. I was just training, hanging out with my dog, you know, hanging out with friends. And that's pretty much it. So I told him, I was like, Hey, he's like, this is what I went to a friend's, you know, grand opening of his thing. And this is where it happened. I was like, these guys came out with me weapons. I just did my, my best to defend myself. Unfortunately that happened to them. And now we're here. So I ended up doing that. Faced, I faced a long sentence and we ended up being it because of the, with, they withheld the evidence or it was, I don't know what the correct term was, but I ended up having a good lawyer and they found it you know, a couple of years later, I'm out. And then when I got out, I, you know, you go through like a weird, I mean, I went through like a pretty weird depression after that, you know, you, you get, especially with the treatment that I received, uh, while I was locked up, uh, you know, I got, I had a solitary confinement. Uh, they gave me what is known as diesel treatment as well, where they drive you around, they keep you awake a lot. So you talk about, you talk. Um, so a lot of things kind of mess with our mind. And then when I got out, this is kind of why I do the thing or led me back to dogs is, you know, I, I got out and I've always been kind of had not really social. Like now, like for me to talk to you or like to do the things I do online is a completely different person than who I used to be. So I was very quiet. Yeah. I didn't talk to no one that I didn't know like super like if you would see me like out like i would just kind of be in the corner by myself or talking to my friends like not really social person i'm more introverted than anything and you know i came out went through a really bad depression um i had like three little sisters that i was trying to help take care of because my my dad uh, had left them because i had three little half sisters and had left their mother and her mother amazing lady um Lisa, she's a really great, great lady. She was trying to, you know, hold it together for them. So I was trying to help her out by spending time with sisters or trying to pay for school stuff whenever I could. So I ended up like living on my own for a little while. But I went through this whole little crazy kind of funk for a while. Got into mixed martial arts. It was cool, but, you know, it was one of those things too where back then MMA, it wasn't like how MMA is now where you can make money doing those things. But it was like you get you actually pay money to get punched in the face. So, so, you know, kind of went through those old things and the, I ended up, you know, going, linking up with dogs and dogs is kind of what saved me from all that, which is you know, kind of the, the passion I have for it, even more. So besides when I was a child, it's kind of what dogs yeah. did for me after all that happened. Yeah. So you said you, you got into a funk after prison and, and like some depression and whatnot. Um, how bad are we talking with your depression? Because that's something I've been through as well. So how's the, how yeah. bad are we talking? It was just one of those things where I didn't see value in like, it just it was just one of those, like, you know, I didn't, after that, like I didn't really have family. So I didn't have like a, you know, I didn't, my dad and I were had on and off relationship. Me and my mother kind of stopped talking um, just from like some family stuff that was going on. So it was just one of those things where I, I, I was very, I've already seen the worst, especially being in prison, being those things, a lot of stuff that's happened in my past, you know, kind of the violence I've seen and, you know, being a part of seeing how people treat people. It went, it was just one of those things where I just didn't, it was no, like, there was no, like a moral judgment for me. It was just more like, this is kind of worth, this is kind of pointless, you know, like doing all these things. Like it was just one of those things where I just didn't, there was the drive that I have now was there, but it was for a different reason. It was more anger and, you know, like, I don't want to say sadness, but kind of, yeah, like it's more like a dark, really dark spot that yeah. I went through um, during that period. It was kind of hard to explain. And I didn't, honestly, I didn't really know that I was going through that. I just kind of thought that that's how life kind of was just because I remember seeing, you know, my aunts, um, uh, you know, constantly fighting and especially when one of my aunts who was you know, highly addicted to drugs, you know, kind of the battle that she had and, you know, my grandpa being as violent as he was and, you know, not really having like a father figure into like that. And like just the people around me, like, you know, a lot of guys that I knew your friends with were in prison. Um, you know, a lot of guys I knew died or young age got killed. So, I mean, it was just one of those things where it just was okay. And, you know, the, I will say, <laughs> I will say this, uh, and, this can probably lead to another story. Like I would 
uh, when I was young, I was really obsessed with like a uh, Rocky, like the movies. Oh yeah. Yeah. So like, I would just like, kind of like when I was going through that period of time, like I just resurfaced with those movies, and I would just like watch Rocky movies because I'd be like, okay, like, I feel like this is like kind of how I should live my life. Like, <laughs> like you know, it should be a little bit better. Like, try to you know, obviously, guy came from a rough past. He's gonna fight to get better, and then like started watching those things, and it kind of reinvigorated me to get better even though mentally i was still a little bit kind of like off yeah and then then mma and dogs yeah shit mate um you you sort of touched on it before and again i'm gonna sort of pick out a few things here um what what years were you talking so when you were incarcerated what years and how old were you so 2002, I got uh, high school, 1920, 2004, uh, between two, the middle 2004 to mid 2006-ish. So and that was yeah, like in and out um, and then got a stint and then pretty much that. But I mean, like I said, I was, I was facing a long, long, long time just from what yeah. happened and, you know, without going too much into the legal aspects of what happened and what because we're a lot of th- a lot of things were done wrong uh on the da side and through the county and everything like that which ended me up to where i was at too so it wasn't fun yeah and so obviously that was um you going in there they're just like their mindset the the prison guards or whatever they're like this dude's a fucking murderer he's a bad guy let's fucking Let's get him. Let's do whatever whatever we need to to fucking make his life unpleasant. Was that was that the mindset from then? Uh, I mean, so it kind of went to this. I mean, like when I first got in, it was, you know, a lot of the detectives are doing their job, and at a very young age, I could I could understand why they were thinking of why. Like I understood why that they profiled me the way they did. If that makes sense, like I knew like, okay, I got in trouble for violence in the past, not violence, but getting into a fist fight, you know, like kids do, but I got in trouble for it. Um, I hung around with, you know, not so, I mean, they were good people to me, but they're not so good, good people when it comes to, you know, law enforcement and some of the stuff that they were doing. And then this incident happens. I, I don't have anything really on paper that I was doing really, that was great anyways. So I understood why I got the treatment that I got. Uh, even though like, I still talk the way that I used to talk now. I mean, I still talk the same way. So I understood, you know, when they arrested me, I didn't fight. I didn't talk shit. I was very respectful. Um, detectives asked me questions. I just was like, you know, I, I'll wait for my lawyer. I'm not going to say anything. And I think a lot of it was, you know, when I first got in, because I mean, the treatment wasn't like super, super horrible, especially in county awaiting trial or like doing anything like that or, or not even waiting trial, waiting judgment, you know, all that stuff, because it wasn't even a trial, really. Um, it was just one of those things where, like, once I got into prison, then I became a number. Um, and then that's when, you know, you don't say much, you don't associate, you don't do things. And especially when you go to, when you get, you know, something happened in prison, which landed me in solitary. And then once I was in there, you know, that's when you start to see kind of like, there's one guard that kind of had it out for me. and you know, they do a lot to, to make you like, to make your life hor- horrible, even though they don't really know you, you know, like there's, you know, if you're not familiar with solitary confinement, it's 23 hours, um, in a small cell, uh, with a, a window that's roughly the size of a picture frame, you know, with it has bars on it and you're just in that cell for 23 hours and you're one hour out. And a lot of those times that one hour out is to shower um, go to a fence cell and to do that. So, and then sometimes you get that shit taken away from you, especially if you have, you know, not if the guard decides that you're being, you know, that you uh, were not listening or doing whatever, like, I mean, shit, you're in a, I'm already in a box. Like, not, <laughs> like what else can I do? Also, we do wrong. So, I mean, yeah. there's some stuff that happens within that. And that's all stuff that kind of led, it led, it led to a lot of like distrust in humanity. You know, they kind of, that's one of the things that kind of messed with me when I came out too. So I had a lot of trust issues coming out of that as well. Oh yeah, mate, hundred percent. Like you know, the system, your friends, I'm sure that most of the guys you were hanging out with weren't really there for you once you got out or even when you're in there, right? 
I imagine. Well, I just talked to a lot of, I mean, before, before what ended up happening, I just kind of was like, Hey, you know, I was like, I just kind of cut contact because the another reason why that I ended up where I ended up is because, you know, people were, you know, the detectives, people like that are asking for information. You know, they want to like, you know, they want you to basically snitch on somebody. And I just, I cut ties with everybody, not necessarily for the sense of I need to protect myself. It's just more of like, I'm not going to get involved in this. I'm not going to get them involved in this. I'm not going to have, because a lot of my friends were older than me at the time. And they are already had, you know, obviously not already started family, but you know, they have kids young. So they have families. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to tie anybody up. So I just kind of kept to myself. Yeah. Which, and that's staunch, bro. Especially for a young, you would have been fairly young, right? Early 20s? Yeah, 21. Thing? Yep. 20, yeah. 21. <laughs> Yeah, shit, man. Dude, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've obviously I don't know much about that sort of world, so why questions are a bit ignorant or whatever. That's that's just no, that's not really my my space. Yeah. So, how do you when you got out and you were feeling a bit depressed? Talk to me about getting into the dogs. Sorry, getting back into the dogs. So I had a. Um, <laughs> that's funny. I so I got out. Uh, I was juggling jobs. I actually got into like car sales because you can pretty much, you can go to prison and go sell a car <laughs> like and have an easy job doing that. So I ended up getting car sale, uh, getting into car sales. Um, I was, the time that my mom had my other dog, um, Kiona, my, the one I rescued, uh, she still had her and my mom weren't really talking too much. I would living on my own. Um, I worked for this place called uh, Beshoff Mercedes Benz, uh, and I was working there. And I ended up meeting a, a client who had this like cute little dog, like little Pomeranian. And you know, right, you see me with Pomeranians, like, oh, that's weird. Um, but she's like, oh, I got a litter, you know, whatever. I sold, you know, sold a sold her a car. She said this had a litter of dogs. Uh, the girl I was dating really wanted uh, this Pomeranian dog type of a thing, right? So I was like, all right. I was like, well, you know, I'll get the dog. And his name was Ben's. Uh, really super cool little dog. Like, <laughs> literally, like so that dog still probably wouldn't. If I, I should know he wouldn't be around anymore. But he was a really cool dog. So I had him. Uh, and he was kind of like my little buddy. Went everywhere with me. You know, kind of did, you know, a bunch of stuff. I kind of taught him the obedience stuff that I kind of, not necessarily I do now, but very similar. A little focus till, you know, kind of shits in the style of stuff. Like, he was a cool little guy. Uh, I got him and I started, I noticed that I was happier when I had dogs and I had like, you know, animals like that. So that was like my first dog by myself after that. Uh, and then I ended up separating from that person. Uh, my mom loved Ben's and then Kiona had just gotten, she uh, gave Kiona away. So I gave my mom Ben's and then I went through life a little bit uh, more kind of just, you know, like I said, kind of going through that phase of, I had like, I had a different job, did some marketing stuff, um, kind of lived like my, what I would live in my early twenties that I didn't do then. I kind of started living that life in my mid twenties um, to late twenties. And then I ended up getting a dog uh, named Marilyn, uh, who's the little, the little pit bull, a little heart tattoo on my face for her. Um, and she was a little tiny, her, daughter, her adoption name was like Poppy, but we in Maryland, this little pit. And she was crazy as hell, super reactive to people, people and to uh, dogs. I would say her dog, I would say dog aggressive, um, how naturally, how natural it was for her um, and people reactive. Uh, so I got her, did some training with her. And Marilyn was like, you know, she essentially took the place of like, you know, Ben's for me. It's like she at that time, I was still uh, training in mixed martial arts and jiu-jitsu. So she go, she went on all my runs with me. Um, she would be with me pretty much nonstop for a large period of time. And got her, uh, was training dogs too, got Bear, and then got a dog named Count, who's like one of my older American bullies, a, a great friend of mine, Billy. Uh, he has Count, um, who's still around kicking butt. I mean, that dog's got to be like 18 years old. It's pretty, it's something pretty crazy. By now, I uh, got them, and that's when I, when I had the dogs and started working with the dogs. That's where like things really started to change for me uh, mentally and everything. Like I was like getting happy. I was happy. I always made the joke. I was like, you know, you know how we humanize dogs a lot. You know, I was like, yeah, the dogs essentially humanized me. Like they turned me into like a functioning human being again. 
And, you know, it was one of those, like, uh, those moments in your life where like, Oh shit changes. I, I can say there's been like two of those moments, like pivotal moments for me. It's been get, you know, when I got Marilyn bear, uh, Marilyn and bear. And then like when I had my daughter, like, you know, my daughter was like, you know, different, you know, obviously a vastly grander scale, but like, you know, you can see that, you know, change in your life. Like those are like two of the more significant moments that I can point out, you know, of like of changing in my life to just kind of show you like to, I guess, paint a picture as far as like, how much those dogs essentially reshaped my life. Yeah. And was your, was mixed martial arts and boxing, was that a part of like recovery for you as well? Or was that just, that was more of an outlet for you, I guess. Um, Boxing was, I just, like I said, I was really obsessed with Rocky when I was like, I mean, still am. And my daughter, we were watching it the other day and she's like, I understand why you are the way that you are. I'm like, thanks. Thanks folks. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> It was like I the boxing was like I was really into like a uh, Rocky. Um, I from just from some of like the scuffles I had gone into and in, like you know the area I was in. Uh, there's like a fire. There's a fire station on the corner of the uh, the block I used to live on in Tampa Way, in Eastside San Jose. And this guy named Pinky, who was a boxing coach, um, was at that fire station a lot. And I had gone into. I got just gone into a fight or gone to a couple of fights down there that the fire got the firemen there were super freaking cool. Like if they noticed things were going on, they would come out, they would stop it. They would never call the cops. Like a friend of mine got his like, you know, he, or he didn't even get in a fight. He like, he fell down like on his bike and then freaking the, cause those cops are, or the, the firemen are like EMTs too. So they, they stitched him up real quick, sent him home. So he, cause we didn't have medical insurance cause we're all poor. So they took care of him real quick. Uh, and then we'd play basketball with them. And then finally, the, one of the guys there, his name was uh, Eric Eric Burns. He was just like, yeah, he's like, hey, Pinky, this is this guy. You know, this is Michael. He's down the street. Uh, he gets in a lot of fights. Maybe take him down to Pal one time. And I went down there. But uh, after that, it was just like, okay, this is really cool. Like, it's not – I like the – even today, like, you know, even back then, like, I really like the technical aspect of it, like how to throw a proper punch you know, how to, you know, footwork, how to do these certain things. Like it was more to me than just like, you know, fighting itself was like, okay, that's a, that's a mean of self-defense. All the fights I've ever gotten into are all means of self-defense. Um, never, never picked, I've never picked a fight in my life. Like ever, ever. Um, and like, you know, I just, I saw them. I saw like, kind of like, you know, I love counter punching when I went into boxing because I started seeing like, oh, the technical aspect of it. So I got really hooked into that. Uh, and it just became like my school, you know, it was like where I learned a lot of life lessons. Um, when I went it, when I came out of everything um, and I got into mixed martial arts, I got into mixed martial arts because I was like doing boxing and like boxing was cool. Uh, I never really, I never really sought out to all that we did, you know, do professional fights to be, a, it was never like a goal of mine to be a professional fighter. It was just something that was there. And then my friend of mine, uh, Jared, and I, I'd heard about like mixed martial arts before, you know, saw like some of the earlier UFC stuff and yeah. there was no real gyms that I knew of. Uh, and then a friend of mine, Jared and I were like sitting at his house one day, I think we we're having a couple beers and the, I don't know if you remember like the first ultimate fighter, like Forrest Griffin versus like Stefan Bonner, like the first one <laughs> that was, a uh, that was on. And like me and my friend Jared were talking, I was like, dude, like, this is crazy. It's actually pretty cool. And then the guy I had, I think, I don't know. I don't know if they made a bunch of money on the first one. They're like, oh, a six figure contract. I was like, damn. I was like, that's kind of like interesting. I wonder like, you know, how boxing would play into this. Cause you know, it was a lot of jujitsu, a lot of like ground fighting. And I knew nothing about wrestling or nothing. So yeah, and I've always, because of boxing and everything like that, I've always been kind of like self critical. Like, would this be able to work well in this situation type of a thing? Yeah. So then I, I always had that in the back of my mind. It always kind of stuck there. And then I moved into a, I moved into a friend of a tattoo house. My buddy's a tattoo house, Ralph. Um, and he was living next to a gym called Fairtex uh, in Mountain View, or which is, which is right around the corner. And Fairtex is like famous for their Muay Thai and all that. So I went to Fairtex. I saw the gym, just kind of fell in love with the atmosphere started training uh met leopoldo sarau who is you know my uh, jiu-jitsu coach still my jiu-jitsu coach and one thing i guess it was it was kind of like therapy for me to answer your question but there was also like a camaraderie that 
really like you know it was something like I, I missed or like something that like really stuck to me and like it was just one of those things like it was like it felt safe like <laughs> even though she getting punched in the you know punched in the face choked you know arms getting bent heels getting twisted like you're getting hurt obviously but it just felt safe to be there like so like i just trained non-stop and then i had a good friend named mako endo who when i wasn't before i started training there because i was a little worried about um going into it like i was just kind of i'm like i said i'm introverted so like i was like oh man i don't know if i want to go i want to kind of you know get in a little more shape because like i said i went through depression again a ton of weight and i needed to get in, in shape so a good friend of mine named mako endo he helped me get like some wrestling mats and like we would meet up every single morning at my house I was in and we would put in work like every single morning. And then finally it was like, okay, like I dropped like 50 or 60, not I think I dropped like 60 pounds. So I was like about 300 pounds. And then uh, I went to Fairtex and then it's just kind of, it was like, it was just like, boom, <laughs> like, you know, like I was just like, all right, cool. Like this is, this place feels safe. It's cool. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with it. I mean, obviously, like, I trained for a long time, and then, you know, life kind of happens, so you take breaks here and there, and or unprecedented breaks just because of, you know, life circumstances. But I've always gone, I've always gone back to training. You know, I train once a week with Leopoldo at his gym uh, in Mountain View, Sorrel Academy. And, you know, I train as much as I can now uh, on my own uh, with you know, friends, or if I just have to do it by myself, you know, I got a little gym here at the house that I have now, so pretty blessed with that but yeah i mean it, i guess it's, it is kind of like a form of like therapy exercise to me the sense of comfort i guess yeah now i get it yeah almost like like i sort of said it before like almost like an outlet because yeah. um i mean do you, do you still you seem like a pretty calm guy do you still have a lot of those frustrations uh, from when you were young a lot of that uh that anger and does mma help with that i i mean i I, I'm nowhere near the person I was back then. Um, I'm very, I am, I'm pretty much like this all the time. Yeah. I mean, I do get frustrated, you know, and like, you know, I do have those you know moments where I'm like, I do kind of get angry, but you know, it's one of those things where I've learned over the years and you know, I continue to learn, you know, it's always like a self, it's always a, a journey, right? Like I'm constantly trying to improve and get better and progress. But like, you know, it's, I learned like certain things I got to do, you know, people always like talk. Yeah. Everyone's always like, Oh, like, cause yeah, I don't know if you well on Instagram, like I run like a hundred miles a week. So like this morning I ran like this morning, <laughs> I run like, I ran 15.5 miles this morning and usually tomorrow I'll run like 30 plus miles. And like, mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I get up at like four in the morning and I do this stuff like every day. But, um, I, you know, I've, I've found things that work for me, you know, that are just, help me kind of place my day right so i don't get to those frustration points but also have i have an amazing wife uh aaron and a great daughter you know ivy and like you know they keep me grounded and understanding of certain things i i i know i have not to say like I, if i didn't have them i wouldn't be like you know i'd be crazy but like i i understand the value of life now and how not to get frustrated and angry over dumb things you know not that I didn't know that, know that before, but now even like greater, especially in my thirties, uh, I grew up a little, I grew up a little late, I guess you can say, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> grew up a little late, but you know, I understand the value of life. I understand, you know, sometimes people are just going through certain things and everyone has their own stuff. So, you know, I still get frustrated from time to time, but I try to keep it even kill and understanding. And I just do certain things to make sure I'm the best I can possibly be. Um, you know, mentally and physically, so it doesn't affect anyone else's life. It doesn't affect our life, and kind of run from there. Yeah, no, it's awesome, man. And dude, there's so much. There's so much you've mentioned before that I want to um, extract, but I just want to hone in on a couple of things. So obviously, um, you said you were diagnosed with cancer, and then you you went through that. Was that you with your current, with your wife, right? That she was with you, and you guys were dealing yeah. with that. Yeah. What years are we talking with that? We're in what, 2023, five, six years ago, okay. five years ago. So I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I've, for timelines, I am. I have so many things happen in my life. My timelines are, because a lot of these things happen at the same time, too. Um, oh, no, I'm like, oh, was that when you were a kid, when you were at all that? <laughs> no, I was, uh, I was, yeah, I was early 30s. I, 
I well, luckily a lot of the stuff happened was like it was low level stuff, so I couldn't. It was misportrayed by not misportrayed, misdiagnosed by the the place the Kaiser, um, by the place I was going to, and I just kind of it was I just I was getting kicked while I was down essentially to me. I had just recently been divorced. Um, there were some issues with my visitation rights to see my daughter. Um, my work life was my work life was insane. Uh, we just had a shift of like employees that I had teach. I had taught like basically, you know, do us dirty and do a bunch of things. So that hit, hit me. Um, uh, we were getting kicked out of the, the big facility we just got. I went to the doctor cause I was having some like real like weird issues, like a stomach wise, sleep wise, um, just some stuff was off and then they, some blood work came back. Like, yeah, like, you know, you got, you know, you have stomach cancer, like time to start making some preparations. And I was just like, whatever, man. I kind of just want, I put my hands up in the air. I'm like, I'm, I'm done. Like, you know, life, you, life, you can only do this stuff too much to, you know, do so much to me. And before I just said like, you know, fuck it. And that's what I did. Uh, and then Aaron, um, you know, she essentially left her life in Minnesota and came down and, you know, she started like, helping me out, taking care of like, you know, taking care of me with some of those really sick mornings I had. And I ended up, you know, obviously getting, you know, getting better uh, and taking care of that. But that's, you know, she helped me get through those like really, 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 really dark times because it was, like I said, there was a lot of things going on um, in my, in my life at that time. I mean, shoot, I mean, six, seven years ago, people see the life we live now, but six, seven years ago, you know, I was sleeping in freaking, I was sleeping in my office, you know, it was, it was uh, some pretty crazy, crazy times back then. And, you know, the cancer thing came in and kind of kicked me while I was down. And, you know, we fought through it, got better. And luckily the diagnosis that I got wasn't as severe as what they originally said. And things just got better. Yeah. So are you in remission? Like it's gone? Or is it yeah, something you can manage? I am. No, no I, am, I am cancer-free. I am healthy. As, I'm, a, I'm healthier now at 39 years old than I've ever been. <laughs> so... It's uh, it's pretty awesome. Things are on the up and up. That's fucking awesome to hear, man. Yeah. All right. Um, hey, dude. So you, I want to talk a bit about Primal Canine, and we can we can go into some of the challenges you've you've had with the business if you want. It sounds like you've had yeah. a lot. Um, you pretty much kicked out of everywhere. You've tried to set up business just because people think you look mean, and they, there's a whole perception about you and what you do. Um. Can you just, I know you did before, can you just give us a bit more of a rundown about how much you bounced around and where your business is now? So uh, we started Primal Canine in South San Jose at a, a kennel called Springdale Kennels uh, where I was volunteering time. Um, and I started there, you know, in the beginning of Primal Canine, there was no, you know, the, my my friend Roy and I always joked around. He's like, you know, you, you know, remember the cartoon Pinky and the Brain? Yeah. Or that he's like, what are we doing today? Pink, you're like, oh, we're going to try to take over the world. You know, like that was like our joke because he always says I was just trying to take over the world. So like, I didn't have like a an agenda. It was just more like, all right, let's just let's grow this company. So we start helping more dogs because there's a lot of people, a lot of trainers, excuse me, a lot of trainers around here. They would, you know, turn away dogs. And then what happens with dogs, they turn away, they get euthanized. So we took on every dog uh, within a year of starting Primal Cannon officially. I had to move to a spot called or spot in, in downtown San Jose and that spot uh, we called the cave. It was just this giant uh, warehouse, not even giant. It was like, I think it was like 2000 square feet, but it was this little tin can. Um, we made it pretty as much as we possibly could. And then I was there for, I was there for like a, almost a couple of years and it just was, it was a small spot, so it wasn't it, it didn't, we we outgrew it. So then I moved to another place down the street, um, on Earl Street, which is like ten minutes from where we were at, a much larger spot, and we started to kind of grow there. And that spot was actually pretty cool. You know, we had outside yard, we had great neighbors, um, you know, centralized location, right off the freeway. We were working there for a long time. Uh, while I was there, I was able to. Uh, start doing like mentorship programs with people. Um, so we, I, I was, all my staff I had before, I trained from square one. So no one came from, I mean, all the trainers I've ever had really have never trained anywhere else. They learned from me and I turned, you know, we 
turn them into trainers and then with the thought of they're going to be trainers for Primal Cannon. So I had uh, started growing my trainers, growing them up. <clears throat> and then I sent out my sister and her boyfriend to Minnesota to open up a Primal Cannon in Minnesota because I was traveling there a lot for work. Um, and that's how I met Aaron as well. And I had opened up trying to promote Canada in Minnesota. I had a couple other apprentices um, and men like mentees who wanted to do Primal Canine. So we did Primal Canine in Los Angeles for a little while. We did one in Memphis for a little while. And then I was kind of managing, you know, my Primal Canine here while everything was growing. And, you know, it was, we were there for a little bit. Uh, Memphis decided to go a different route, which was still really good friends with Jacques uh, and Allegiance. And then Chris um, with LA did one a different route, which, you know, still really good friends are still, you know, acquaintances with him, uh, can I logic. And then um, we ended up finding out that my sister had embezzled a bunch of money um, and kind of did us dirty over there. So that we parted ways with that. Uh, I knew Aaron through rescue uh, work uh, with pit bulls because she had uh, tattooed and bullied. Um, and, you know, she was heavily involved in the Minnesota or the Twin Cities uh, rescue world. So she was over there. I asked her, I was like, hey, do you know anybody or would you be interested in taking over this, um, you know, or at least helping me out over here? And she jumped on it right away. Uh, I actually would fly down there, you know, almost on a monthly basis to do workshops for a rescue over there and then train dogs that we had over there. And, you know, we were at that spot. And then uh, that whole construction thing I was telling you about, because um, there was a bunch of old buildings around, uh, went down. and we. At Primal Canine, we had a what thing called Fit Pet Daycare, which is like day training, but we do, you know, training for the dog. Uh, but we also like, you know, we put them on treadmills. They do agility. You know, they get yard. They get a bunch of playtime, so the dogs get fulfilled mentally and physically. So we did Fit Pet Daycare, and they burnt. They blew those buildings up, and shh, they're some of the biggest rats I've ever seen in my life. I mean, at the time, like I was saying, I was like. <laughs> I was, I was living in that facility because I had recently got divorced and my ex-wife took the house and stuff. So I was living in the facility and like I would have cameras in the my office slash bedroom and I would just see these cat-like rats running around. And I was, I finally called the landlord like after like two days of it happening because I set traps up. I called exterminators. I did everything I possibly could to keep, to keep the dog safe. And finally the guy was like, no, nah, we can't do anything about it. And I'm like, well, okay, well, I got to move. I'm not going to have dogs, you know, around these freaking cat sized rats. So yeah. we ended up moving it, to this place. Good. Oh, I was going to say, is that, is that how big the, the rats were? We, like, yeah, we those things about... were fucking huge, man. Like, they're like <laughs> massive things. Like so, putting a collar on it, and you're like, hey, I finished. Yeah. Here's your dog. You're like, it's a fucking rat. <laughs> it was nuts. It was, it was, it was pretty, like, some of like, the rat traps that we had, like, they would still be alive, like the sticky ones. And I'm like, oh my God, you guys are like 15 pounds. But um, so we ended up through a, doing a, a old client of mine. She and you had somebody because they're both in real estate. And she's like, oh, we got this this place. It's zoned for you. Everything's great. Had this giant yard. Um, had the, actually like a living quarters inside of it too. Had a bunch of training rooms. It was, it was pretty much the ideal spot that I, I could have at that time. So we jump in, we jump on it, we start the move, and that's when all this, this stuff happened. Um, we paint the building black because that's what we do. We would show up, paint the building black, put the primal cannon sign on it, you know, put turf in, you know, make it look pretty. And then, you know, we did those things. Uh, the animal control officer gives me a call, tells me, hey, this is what's going on. Obviously, we weren't there yet, so nothing was going on. On our side, I let him know that. He told me he had passed the word down. And then, uh, you know, we lost that spot uh, going through the whole legal process and ended up going to uh, Morgan Hill. And they rezoned uh, there. I think we are a little bit over a year there uh, and went into Gilroy, which is the city uh, south of it. And ever since then, we've been in Gilroy. You know, Gilroy has been nothing but great to us. And every, every move we've had since then has just been to expand. Um, cause it's just, it's just a growth. I mean, every move we've always had has been to grow, um, and expand and help, uh, one better our services and be able to help more and more people and their dogs. So it was just, it was just growth and growth and growth. And now I'm just like, I'm happy that we're like, you know, my wife and I, we got our house, we bought our house a few years ago. 
you know, we got, you know, we have our facility, everything is nice and stable and good. And, you know, we're, you know, Primal Canyon itself has been a journey. We've been through, we've been through a lot of, a lot of, uh, chaos, um, and a lot, a lot of his stuff. And I, I think a lot of the issues that we had uh, when it comes to rezoning and doing those things was just kind of, it was like a lot of like misunderstanding of what we were doing because yeah. it's just like, you know, when people talk about us now, like it's still funny to me because like people always go like, oh, you know, you guys do so much personal protection or you do so much, you know, like the dogs that bite. But in reality, like, you know, I mean, obviously I do, a lot of, I mean, I work a lot of dogs, you know, cause we have a lot of dogs, um, and I'm getting, you know, kind of been known for my decoy for a while now, uh, and for like the style of training, but like, you know, predominantly like my whole over 20 something years of dog training now has like been behavior mod, you know, like I deal with a lot of like, I dealt with a lot of pet stuff with all my guys, like my trainers now, they deal with a lot of like behavior, like behavior mods. So like when people are like, oh, you guys just do the bite dogs. I'm like, yeah, like this percent, <laughs> like the rest of it's like helping people with their dogs, re- like, you know, making sure we're helping them build better relationships and the dogs aren't being all reactive or biting people or dogs or fights. I mean, like that was like a lot of what we were doing, but you know, and, you know I'll, I can take some blame for that too. I mean, like, you know, we post the, there's some stuff we post online. that's like, cause I mean, I, I mean, in my when I was talking to like our, cause I have like a team that we run with the, the Canada university and like street league. When I was talking to those guys, I was like, I just post a lot of stuff. Cause I think it's freaking cool. It was just like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's kind of cool, man. Like I just thought I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Like I didn't think of it. Like here's like a resume or like a, this is what we do every single day. It's just like, nah, well now I do it every day. Cause I have the dogs. But back then it was like, this is just kind of cool. It's a cool video. I thought I'd be like, I thought you'd be like, Oh, Hey, like that's, you know, art, you know? Versus like they're teaching these dogs to be aggressive, and I'm like, that, I mean, there's I have one dog here who will probably who will murder somebody if told to Ozzy, but you know the rest of them are just like you know they're pretty cool with you, like they're always they're very social and just when they're told to bite, they bite. Yeah. So you, do you think that was a big part of you getting the ass from all those places? They were just like, ah, I've got all these bad bite dogs, and we don't want them here. <sighs> Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. I mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding. You know, they see the decoy fighting with the dog. They think it's this, they think it's that. And, uh, yeah, you yeah, know, I, the animal, yeah. yeah, I mean, I get it. You know, like if you're not, I mean, I always try to, you know, me and my wife talk about this a lot. Like what's normal to us is like extreme to others. I mean, like, yeah, it's like, it's crazy. It's like, well, I mean, my daughter talks about this all the time. My daughter's nine years old going on 20. So she's like, we were talking about it because like I have her on the weekends and, you know, she shoots a bow. She shoots like two different types of bows. She has a little uh, BB gun AR. She does boxing with me. She throws axes and knives and like she has like a little 3D printer. She like designs stuff on it and like we talk about it and she's like, dad, she's like, she's like, daddy, she's like, you know, like, you know, when I tell my friends that what all the stuff that we do on and she, she can drive like one of our UTVs and she works dogs. She's like, I tell my friends that like, these are the stuff they do. She's like, no one ever believes me. So like, I made her like this little like reel of like, this is what we're gonna do. And one day, and I showed like I saw it on my my page, and I gave her the video. And she's like, yeah. She's like, everyone thinks that we're crazy. I'm like, well, she, I don't know. Maybe we are. I don't like. I don't. Like, I don't know what it is. But it's a it's a thing that we we I constantly try to keep in mind is like what we view as normal, what's happened, what we do every single day isn't necessarily what the normal or the average, I want to say, oh, I hate to only use the term normal, but like someone who's not living the life that we live would understand, you know, or could possibly relate to because they don't live in that life, right? Like they're not part of it. You know, that's not yeah. their reality. You know, their perception is vastly different and a lot of it's because of what's out there media wise, right? So we just kind of like chalk it up to that and be like, okay, well, you know, you should understand it. But the thing that kind of bugs me about like the moves and everything like that was, I get perception is one thing when you don't have, when you're not happy, you don't have the person that you're talking to right in front of you or someone showing you like, no, this is what we actually do. But when you have the evidence in front of you and you have the people who are doing the stuff in front of you and it's no longer these one minute or five minute clips on YouTube and it's the reality of the situation and you still choose to decide that, you know, that's the, that's where I still have those issues. Cause you know, I'm just like, man, I was like, if you'd have just talked to us, no, you did talk to us. You did realize that we weren't doing that, but you were afraid of the optics of what it looked like, yeah. not what it was. 
and that's why you did the thing that you did. It's like to me, that's that's one of the more troubling things, which is why I'm so grateful for the, you know, the city of Gilroy, because you know they were just like, hey, you guys are cool. You guys take care of the community. I mean, I mean, shit. During like the pandemic, we uh, we we fed people every Tuesday through this restaurant called uh, Margaritas. We did like Taco Tuesday, so people lost their jobs or whatever they did, they can go in there and say, hey, we're part of the Primal Canine Food Program. And so we did that with the uh, margaritas at uh, Morgan Hill and then um, Straw Hat Pizza in Gilroy. And we took care of them. And the Gilroy community was like, all right, cool, you're one of us. So they've always taken care of us here. Yeah. Hey, Matt, that's, that's probably a good segue, dude, because um, we were talking, obviously, offline about some of the stuff that you do. Um, obviously, that was a bunch of stuff I hadn't heard about before, the work you do with the community. Um, can you just go into the the human trafficking stuff that you were talking about. Um, when when did you become aware of that stuff? And then, like, what was the impact it had on you? So, uh, let's see. Last was it last year or earlier this year? Uh, it's been within a year's time frame. So we start well. We started Street League three years ago, and where Street League is growing. This the reason why Street League is involved is because I'll tell you right now. We started Street League stuff, and the idea with Street League was to better the community, better the culture, um, all the way around. And what I wanted to do was every city that we go to for Street League, I wanted to donate the proceeds or a portion of the proceeds to troubled youth in that area. We were planning on making a move to Florida, and I have a good friend, uh, Billy Girardi, uh, who's the owner of Miami Tattoo Company, uh, if you see him online. And I was like, hey, man, we're going to come to Florida. Do you know anybody uh, who... Or do you know like anything about troubled youth organizations? And he said he he didn't know too much about it, but he brought up uh, human trafficking because that Miami too a tattoo company. Him and his, uh, I guess mentor in the mentor in the situation more, uh, where they do tattoo cover ups of the branding that survivors of human trafficking get when they're in, because a lot of the survivors are people who are in human trafficking. You know, basically the women and children uh, who are being trafficked. Uh, and it's all people think it's like an international thing, but a lot of it is domestic in the United States um, and they get, they get branded. So once they're able to get either escape uh, their traffickers or, you know, a trafficking ring gets busted and then they get, you know, taken into custody, the survivors, um, you know, they have these brands on them, whether they're tattoos or whatever it may be. So Billy and Amore, uh, they were, they do the tattoo cover up for them. Um, over at Miami Tattoo Company. So Billy had mentioned, hey, like we can do this uh, and we can, you know, maybe you can donate to Glory House Miami. And when I heard like the stories, when I heard all the stuff that was going on, um, like I said, like I, for me, it was enthralling in the sense of like, not enthralling, that's the wrong word. It was like, it kind of enra it enraged me a little bit to know that that stuff was happening, you know, and like, you know, people were, you know, abducted or drugged and put into this world of, you know, it's human traffic, which is insane to me. So Billy kind of gave me the information. Um, we started talking about survivors. He introduced me to one survivor. And then she mentioned she, or they somehow the topic of getting dogs. And, you know, I want, I want to help as many people as I possibly can help, um, especially people who have gone through a rough, you know, rough past or anything like that. And to me, you know, I was just like, man, I was like, I'm, in the, I'm in a place now where I can help somebody. So I wanted to do anything I possibly could. I told Billy, it's like, you know, when, when Billy were talking, I'm like, dude, like, well, let's just start a program where we help survivors and uh, and get them dogs. So the first person wanted a dog she could feel safe around. Um, you know, she can go to, she's a young young lady and she's out, she's out now and safe, thank God. Um, but she's got, she's getting her life together. She's going to school. She's apprenticing under Billy. Um, head on straight so we got her a puppy and actually it's trained the puppy's actually being trained right now with uh, my miami my florida primal canine uh, chris corley the owner and head trainer over there um he's raising two of them and then billy got another one uh another survivor who kind of went through him his and amores uh, like clearance like they talked to them make sure their life is good uh who actually needed a dog who can protect her because she's actually someone who goes and tries to save uh, these uh, survivors or these people who are still, you know, being trafficked. 
So she's out in like the field where, you know, people may try to like take her or do anything like that. Cause she's someone who's advocating for survivors. So she needed a dog who can actually protect her and be a somewhat of a service animal to her, or at least provide emotional support. So we got her a dog, uh, and these dogs are all donated through Ireland Working Canine, Graham O'Reilly over there. Um, he donated these dogs uh, to us. We just had to get shipping, pay for shipping, because shipping is expensive. So we got these dogs over here, and we trained them. Uh, Primal Canine Florida is handling that because the survivors are in Florida uh, as well. So we started doing that through the fight workshops, um, the fight raffle. Uh, and, yeah, man, this means that. The thing about the human trafficking, which is the most when I when I heard about it, is it nothing really like once you know about the statistics and things are happening, it's like it's hard to not know about it now. Like you can kind of turn a blind eye to it, but in reality, like human trafficking is is a huge, huge, huge business. And you know, like I was telling you before, you know, it's even the crazier thing about it is like you know, these, these people who are involved in the traffickers or whatnot, you know, these are products essentially that they're selling, you know, they're, yeah. and it's, and it's even crazier about it. Cause the way it was explained to me is like, you know, you can sell drugs and then it's like, okay, you sell a drug and it's gone. Right. Like they, you can't, you have to buy it again, do this, but you can sell a person. And then when the other person's done with it, they can, you can resell that person and resell that person. So these people are getting abducted young and then they're constantly getting recycled over and over again in this horrific way it's disturbing, you know, and it's, um, so for me, once I heard that, uh, and talking to Billy and then Chris, my partner in Florida and, you know, now Scott Crawford and a couple other guys and you know, my wife, I was like, you know, this is something that I'm heavily passionate about, um, you spreading the word and also making sure that we do everything we possibly can to, I mean, I know like, you know, a handful of people aren't, is it going to stop a multi-billion dollar, you know, whatever you want to call it business or type of a thing, but at least we can do our best to help out where we can spread the word and help people while we, while we're doing it. So we developed the, uh, the fight workshops where we teach people how to defend themselves, um, incorporating, you know, my old coaches, Leopoldo, uh, surround surround Academy, a good friend of mine, Faraz Azab, uh, with the Kansas city or the warriors, Kansas city gym. Uh, they do Krav Maga, um, they come in and then we teach people how to defend themselves, uh, have situational awareness, how to de-escalate things. And then if you have a personal protection dog, how to use your personal protection dog and keep you and your dog safe. And then the proceeds go to uh, Glory House Miami uh, and then securing more dogs for survivors uh, throughout the United States. Because it's, it, like I said, it, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's horrifying when you figure out when you know the amount of trafficking that's going on, like it's, yeah, it's, it's disturbing. Like, I mean, did, I mean, I bet you like most people don't know this, but like major sporting events are probably the site of the highest level of trafficked people in the world. So like the super bowl, um, like those like soccer, like the big soccer, like world cup games. Cause a lot of these things, and it, I, this is all information that you guys can find online. Um, so fact check me, please, and, and read the stats. But I mean, <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is where people, a lot of rich people come in, a lot of, you know, traffickers come in and that's where a lot of these deals are made. And, you know, it's just, it's a, a sick thing that this stuff happens. I mean, if you ever travel in the airport, like listen to what they say on this, on the things, like if you're ever traveling and you hear like the, the people the announcements going on, there's always a human trafficking one that happens. Like in our in our efforts to stop human trafficking, if you see someone suspicious or someone doing that, like, you know, the hand signals, like, please report this to your nearest official, like, you know, call this number, like that stuff. There's a reason why that's there is because that happens quite a bit. Yeah. It's like I said before, offline, it's not something in our collective consciousness, probably this over there as the same as it is here. Um, yeah. But I've seen, like, I've seen some of the, I think I even seen a handful in Australia, but mostly in the States, those posters on the back of the toilet, you know, human trafficking and um yeah. can you mate, can you give me some of the statistics, like some of the some of the numbers we're talking about when it comes to human trafficking? Yeah. Let me look at some stuff. Cause I have Billy sends me this stuff all the time, which is like fuels my fire to want to <laughs> to, to do absolutely much as I can now. So California has uh, consistently been had the highest number of human trafficking cases, uh thirteen hundred uh, cases were reported in uh, 
just 2021 itself. And then, let's see, the number of people falling victim to human trafficking around the world continues to grow. It is one of the higher, uh, so here's another statistic during the pandemic, uh, I guess identified worldwide more than quadrupled during the pandemic from 30,000 a year to 120,000 a year, uh, when it comes to survivors or victims of human trafficking. So, I mean, there's a ton, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stats out there. Um, Billy did send me this one thing and I'm trying to find it where they talk about the revenue aspect of it. It might've been for Miami tattoo company. Let me see it here. I try not to keep a lot of these things on hand for me because it, it does drive me a little bit crazy when I know all these things and I'm like, yeah. It'd be like your, um, your, your social media algorithm, right? It'll feed you a lot of stuff. Oh uh, yeah. I try not to watch it. <laughs> I try not to look at it ever. Let's see here. There's one. 99 billion of which, uh, dang. So another source uh, shows that. What does this thing say? So human trafficking earns global profits of roughly 150 billion a year for traffickers and 90 billion of it, 99 billion of which comes from commercial sex exploitation. So a lot of uh, people who are either abducted or get, you know, into drugs or whatnot into these organizations end up becoming used for, you know, prostitution and all that other, or sex exploitation, whatever they want to call it. But I mean, all the stats are consistently growing uh, from what I've heard. I mean, I have friends in San Jose PD who work in the human trafficking uh, division and they just did a big bust uh, out here last month or so, which you can look up as well. Um, out in Gilroy, Oakland, and everything like that too. So it's crazy, man. It's it's. I mean, it's you know, it's it's wrong hundred percent, and it's also freaking like. I think a lot of it, you know, for me, because I got I went down the rabbit hole pretty quickly on all this stuff. Is you know, it was just one of those things where once you know it, you it's very hard to shut it off. You know, like to yeah, to not I to not know. It. But now knowing that the reality of it is that it, it's, you know, it's it's something that happens. You know, people get abducted, people get put into this this world, you know, and it's it's quite often, and it seems to be quite often happening. So, they, yeah. I think you know, majority of the world needs to kind of not, because I mean, I think a lot a lot of times people just have this thing where if it doesn't happen to them or it doesn't happen around them, it's not happening, right? Like that's kind of like the bubble we like to live in. And, yeah. In reality, this is one of those things where we have to realize that this is happening and we have to understand it because, you know, it's not like not to say, you know, drug addiction and all this stuff is not isn't a very serious thing, which it is. You know, those are very serious problems. But we're talking about like, you know, young people getting abducted or forced into trafficking, you know, which is which of it, which essentially means like into sexual exploitation and just from my information that i've gotten from billy from Amore, these are like kids you know and they're sold over and over again to adults who are using them for very bad things and they're abused and they're you know they get their they get their you know childhood taken away from them they get their life taken away from them they're forever going to live with these things that's, that's happened to them if they live at all and not to even to mention like the stuff that they have to deal with once they're out of those things where, you know, you're talking about drug addictions and people trying to, you know, not deal with the life that they've had to live. I mean, imagine having to live through that. Like, you know, I don't, that's, that's just insane to me. So like, you know, the, the stats I always rely on billion or more for when it comes to them knowing exactly what's going on. But I mean, to me, it's just more like, damn, like, you know, these people are suffering they gotta, you know, something's gotta be done and, you know, hopefully we can help them out there. Yeah. And um, man, it's, this is it's illuminating and it's it's fascinating at the same time because it's like obviously the scale of the tragedy of the whole thing, mate. Who who is like? The, is there a demographic that is the recipient of someone who's been human trafficked? Is there, is it like 
elite rich people or is it like a certain part of society? Like who, who's benefiting from this? I'm not too positive on, I know so far, I know the, so I know the bus that happened over here and I'm, to be honest, I'm not even sure if I'm legally able to say it, but I know it was like some form of, it was a, it was a, an organization that was doing the trafficking that wasn't from the U S. Um, so they were doing some of the stuff here, a legal organization. Um, I know they're all, all illegal organization. Uh, I know that the, what, the, what happens like during the Super Bowl, for example, is one of, is the, one of the bigger, biggest human trafficking events of the year. And I want to say some made some of the soccer tournaments too. I don't know. It just, I would, if you get a chance, Google, bigger human trafficking events and you can see it all for yourself during sporting events right so i know it's because a lot of elites come in this is what it's been told uh to me um but i mean there's a lot of fucking sick people man that's like there's a lot of fucking sick deranged people who are doing this i and i talked to eric stambro at working dog radio and, to, and ted summers um i did this because i went on a lot of podcasts earlier this year when we were doing the first fight uh workshop yeah, and even like Eric, who's a former law enforcement guy, he was telling me he's like, man, he's like, and they're like in somewhere like Ohio or they're somewhere in the middle of the U.S., right? So it's not like they're like some like coastal area or anything like that, but like they're saying like there's tons of human trafficking going on there, domestic based. Like, yeah, you know, kids either get people you know who get kidnapped or gets you know stuck into the drug world or whatever it may be, and then they get you know solicited into you know prostitution or forced into those type of things and you know they get owned by people and then they get sold out and do those things again and it's just you know it's a sickening thing you know it's a and i mean a lot of this stuff too i mean like a lot of these people are what's it called conditioned is that the what's that's proper term to thinking this is like a normal way of living you know yeah like like it's in it's in it's in it's insane like you can go so far down down this rabbit hole of like seeing what it is but like you know it's just you know, it's just something that needs to be stopped or at least freaking identifying that people need to to really realize that this is happening and at any point in time like anybody can you know obviously you know what's more than likely it's you know young women and children who can become victims of this and you know it's a it's a it's a shitty thing yeah because i'm sure like you just said before you know they potentially conditioned into this this life but i imagine it's not always as cut and dry as like they just get snatched off the street and then thrown into the sex trade they're you know they're probably their parents put them up to it or a relative or it's someone yeah. they trust or a family friend like i'm sure there's a lot of nuance to it like you said where they just be conditioned into it not just snatched out of some nice suburban neighborhood with a white picket no. fence and then they're just they're in fucking i don't know some fucking shit well, I mean it. like I mean there's like stories I've heard where it's like you said too I mean it could be it's a lot of it is like you know they're already in the shitty situations growing up um family friend or them or you know their parents themselves could potentially condition them to be used to this so they can utilize them for income themselves or do things like that or, I mean like there's so many varieties <laughs> of stories that I've heard um anywhere from you know the abductions to family selling their kids to um, like just just doing right like things like there's so many different stories too it's not as cut and dry as most people would think which is yeah. why i think the conversation needs to have ha have to happen because you know i think a lot of times when people think like human trafficking they think like oh some but you know someone from the u.s went to a different country and smuggled in some kid or did something like that or they do things of that nature where in, in reality i mean from what i you know talking to the people i've talked to a lot of this is like at least in the states like it's it's people from here it's domestic and i believe it's the same way i believe it's the same stuff everywhere else you know i believe it's the same in every other country i mean I, it's not just the united states i mean i know it's a big international thing too so you know it's just a, yeah it's a shitty reality but in the end of the day it's a reality that uh you know people need to not come to terms with but understand and you know start taking a little more action and when it comes to you know defending and protecting our families and even not our families but you know other people too you know this is like the 
the human aspect of things, man. Like we all may not agree on certain things, but at the end of the day, you know, human is a human and we got to be able to, you know, help other people in need. And, and especially nowadays, you know, where everyone's so much at each other. It's like, look, at, we got some real problems. You know, we got some like real, real issues as humans right now, you know, that are, oh, shit, yeah. that, that need to be helped, you know, taken care of. Yeah. And mate, can you talk, talk through the fight? So that's, that's the program where you're obviously, um, helping rehab these people. Um, give, can you give us an idea about some of the successes you've had as well? I've noted that we just talked about like the worst part of that industry. Um, yeah. Talk about the good parts, man. So, I mean, the great, I mean, one of the coolest things over this last, the first fight workshop, uh, you know, we had one of the survivors come in. Um, she's one of the, got one of the dogs and she part, and it's again, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm nobody in this, in this situation. I was thrusted into, I was, informed about the situation a year plus ago um, and Billy and Amor really guided me through it and they gave me the information and they kind of found the survivors. So I just put the fight together. The fight itself is a workshop um, that teaches people self-defense, anybody and everybody self-defense um, with and without a dog, you know, threat assessments, all those things. We just use the proceeds to help um, survivors of human trafficking. But the first one we did, a survivor came in one of the ones again, the dog that's, uh, you know, friends with Billy no more is actually one of Billy's uh, apprentices came down and she's a young lady, uh, very intelligent. She came down, she met her puppy, uh, and she took the course and she, and she loved it. And a lot of these people who were survivors of human trafficking, you know, they're for rightfully so they can be very intimidated. They can be very off put by men. Um, and especially when it comes to, physical combat i mean like she's punching you know she's hitting guys she's hitting us she's you know she's she's learning self-defense and she's in this kind of chaotic not chaotic atmosphere but if you've ever gone to if anyone's ever gone to like a combat sports gym or a kickboxing class it can be a little intimidating when you first walk in you're like i don't want to look dumb or like i don't want to get hit like you know just things of that nature so there's a lot of things yeah. happening let alone being a young lady who's just you know spent a lot of her childhood in these things coming to us and flying from Florida to here. And she's having it rough over there where like some of the traffickers are looking for her and things of that nature. So she got, she found security with us. She felt good with us and she ended up learning things. She's still hungry to, you know, I have contact with them. She's hungry to learn more. She's, you know, she was empowered by it. And to me, that was, that was one of the major signs of being like, all right, we're doing the right thing. This is like, you know, this is not to, not that we, I didn't think they were doing the right thing, but it was like one of those like solidifiers of like, all right, we got to keep doing this. Like we got to keep, you know, helping these people out. And, you know, the, besides, you know, the survivor, like everyone that attended their first fight workshop, you know, everyone was raving about it for months. You know, it wasn't like the normal, like, you know, you go to a dog workshop and you're like, that was that one week of like, oh, this was so inspiring. Right. And then like, this was like months of it to the point where, you know, some of my street league club members, uh, they actually contract <laughs> Leopoldo, my, the main jujitsu guy, uh, to come to the shop every Saturday and teach them, you know, like yeah. jujitsu. And like, so we actually have those courses like at our facility. And now with the fight workshop, we're going to start, um, we're going to do a ranking system similar to like jujitsu belts or like, you know, any other martial arts, uh, with people. And, keep this this fight going one not so only can people can learn how to defend themselves and operate with the dog especially in like the protection realm um but also like so we can continue to help these survivors and continue to provide you know more uh dogs to the ones that, that need them and you know money and financial aid to uh, the organizations that need it because like i said it is a it's a lot more than most people think you know there's a lot more people out there who are survivors of human trafficking or in human trafficking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like in my mind, I, I, I immediately go, how do you not know that there's a, you know, a hundred thousand people missing, but I guess it's like you were saying before, it's not so cut and dry. It's not like you got snatched out of your front yard and you're like, fuck, where's my daughter? It's like, you know, yeah. the last six months she's been getting abused by someone drugs are involved then it's you know go over there a couple of times a week and then all of a sudden gone and it's just yeah it's man it's it sounds lot, like man. such it's... a complex issue dude and the recovery oh, the lifetime 
Ethan. It's, yeah, man. It's one of those things where it's like, because I mean, people, when we first got these two dogs to people, like, you know, the, their Malinois, by the, their Malinois, so like, you know, we got them a couple of Malinois out there and like, they're like, oh, you know, someone asked me like, or oh, is everything going to be Malinois or anything like that? I was like, no, I was like, you know, these ladies are, you know, they're stable, they're capable of doing things. But I mean, there's some survivors that, you know, don't need those dogs, which is why we're going to give every single, you know, we're going to give a different type of dog to them, whatever they can handle. Cause like you said, like it's a recovery process, you know, you know, sometimes these people go through coping mechanisms, like drugs, like alcohol, like doing things just so they can, you know, and I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not saying like drugs and alcohol are fine, but I mean, I mean, fuck man, like you go through shit like that. Like it's, it's understandable as to why you would be using these type of things to help cope. Right. Like, especially if you don't, yeah. you're never given the right information on how to cope in majority of your life or a significant part of your life you've been stuck in, you know, this hell. So, I mean, a lot of these people are going through recovery, not necessarily just for, you know, the human trafficking side, but what, what stems the problems that stem from being it trafficked or being, I mean, you know, being in those, in that world, you know? So it's like, it's a lot, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of different things, a lot of different stuff going on, but I mean, yeah, we're, we're supplying dogs to the ones that can happen and, yeah, not as cut and dry. There's a lot of uh, moving parts there. Yeah, yeah, it sounds horrendous, man. And I, I look, I haven't actually seen that movie. That was the Sound of Freedom, I think it's called. Yeah, man. It when this all came I about, seen like, it. oh yeah, no, it's brutal. Um, when this all came about, that that movie, it was all like kind of coincidental. Uh, when Billy brought this up to me, uh, that movie was coming out. And I'm already like, if I'm like, if I get attached to something, like, cause obviously what Billy told me and like hearing all the stories, you know, that already kind of like, it kind of, you know, I already heard put my, I already sunk my teeth into it. So I was like, okay, we're here. And then my wife and I went to go watch that movie. And man, that thing had me like, I was, I was the one, it was, it's sad, obviously, you know, the kid, like, you know, that that's cause it's a true story, you know? And then, yeah then you're like you know then you're enraged then you're like what the, who the fucking does this you know like yeah who, like what type of let alone the people who do the trafficking aspect of it but people who want to do that to a kid you know or like you know or anybody like you know what the like what the fuck is wrong with people like you know it's just it's just one of those things where i was just like all right so then that's kind of stuck me stuck us in deeper and like we really put our foot down and like all right cool like we're we're going to keep this fight going. And that's where like the fight name come from, came from. It was like, all right, like we're, we're going to keep fighting. Like this is what's going to happen. Yeah. And like after the show, man, if you can, I'll get you to send me a bit of info about it. Cause I'll, I'll, when I do the promo and whatnot for this podcast, I want to, I want to put it up there and, and I don't know, my 4,000 followers will do anything about it, but I'll, I'll put it up there. Cause I want to promote it a bit, man. Um, yeah. Yeah, and dude, look, I'll we'll probably start wrapping up the potty on that yeah. note. Just I've got a couple of final, uh, final questions from you uh, for you. Um, so obviously, given that you're doing this fight stuff, um, problem with canine, canine street league, and whatnot, um, dude, what's the future looking like for you, man? What what sort of big plans do you have on the horizon? I got a lot. <laughs> Um, well, mate, given and, your history, <laughs> I'm going to say you've probably got a lot on in the future as well. Uh, I mean, so we, I mean, it, the the thing like with us is, you know, continue to provide and expand uh, our services to the people in Primal Canine and the community. Uh, continue to grow that. Uh, we got some plans in Primal right now with expansion of our day training, our normal uh, rage and train stuff. We have some other stuff with Primal that's going to help. Uh, I mean, the human trafficking aspect of it. Um, where it's going to be a major thing that we can't really talk about just yet uh, because you know, yep. government's involved. Um, then we have, you know, the fight workshop where we're going to be doing, we're actually going to start a ranking system of it. So there'll be more frequent uh, workshops because it's, you know, people are able to earn rank, like, you know, white belt, blue belt, you know, stuff like that. Um, and those things, uh, especially with the addition of the personal protection dogs, uh, street league, um, that's, now national we just did our last trial in florida um next year uh we go to mexico city uh to do a workshop at peck gym uh ecuador uh our our decoy director chris corley and one of our decoys scott crawford is going to go with one of our decoys uh, juan and go do a workshops in ecuador and put on some mock trials 
uh, we're possibly going to the UK for that as well uh, to get build it. So Street League, its growth is growing exponentially. It's it's just harder for me. Street League itself is just harder to make sure that we maintain the quality because that's a huge thing for me. Because with Street League, it's Street League. Uh, the goal of it was to because it's a professional sport. So decoys get paid, uh, the handlers get paid, the top three finishers get paid, and you know we put a big event on, music going on, vendors are out there, people are cheering. We want to make sure people, the handlers, the decoys, everyone's getting appreciated and it's a big family fun fun family event so just make, make sure we're maintaining that and it doesn't turn into like you know the uh what's it called the uh the toxic world of dog sports that happens you know yeah, we don't want we don't want it to be that. yeah we, we're trying to keep it you know very straightforward and non-toxic and no bs involved so street league's there um and it's growing you know we have the canine university you know mike nesbeth's on there we're continuing to growing uh, that platform. So I put on, I, I record a lot of courses. We have a lot of our other guys recording courses. So that's always a really good one. Uh, we just launched uh, tequila, uh, Kavik on them, uh, our tequila a collaboration with Margaritas and Morgan Hill. So that's the first tequila came out, which is an Anejo. Uh, I, I'm currently uh, dieting right now. So I have yet to, uh, I, I did take part. It took a year about a year of Marco. Uh, Marco was the, the guy who actually found it. Like he traveled Mexico everywhere for a year or two to find this tequila um, and finally decided on it. And then he has it as restaurant and then he wanted to collaborate with us. Uh, we wanted to collaborate with each other because we do a lot of things together. And um, so we just launched that. That come, that becomes available this week or no, I believe next week. So we have that. Um, and, you know, the plans are always been like, it's grow as much as we can, you know, like my, like my clothing, my other business, our clothing company, Carpe Omnia, you know, it means take everything. So we're, you know, it's kind of what we're here to do. And <laughs> it's a, uh, we have all that stuff going on and, you know, plus my collaborations with Ray Allen and uh, Omerta and all those things, man. So it's just continue to grind, grow, get better, try to help the community out as much as we can, try to help people out as much as we can. and help these dogs out you know so that's kind of it i mean yeah i think i didn't forget anything <laughs> that's good man and it's just it's exactly what i thought you'd be doing a lot of stuff <laughs> um, yeah. uh dude what what's your favorite piece of canine gear and why so let's see my favorite piece of canine gear is it's one it's got to be so it, are you familiar with the Incog line that I designed with uh, Ray Allen? Is like that the like Incog the elusive stuff? collar, that kind of stuff? No, it's like the, the tree pouches that go in your pocket or like your hoodie or like the t-shirt oh. with the pocket or the sweater. Oh, yeah, 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 correct. So it's got to be the Incog line uh, because it was one of those things that had never been done before in an industry that everything's always been done. And it was a cool collaboration between because it was my, when I first started my relationship with Ray Allen, it was the suit that I helped design and then the harness and yeah, we did the R&D for it. But then the Incog was the first one that we like that I was like, oh, man, let's do this. Like, let's do this whole thing. And you know, Matt Wilson was great and was like, all right, let's I flew down there. We worked on a couple of things and it's more sentimental reasoning, I guess. Um, yeah. Function is great, obviously. But it was just one of those things where like I held it. And I was just like, the first one was the pocket and the hoodie, the hoodie one. And I was like, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is so cool. So it's probably that, you know, the, it's probably that one for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like, that's got to be, that's probably got to be the one. And then the, obviously the the suits and all the stuff that we've designed. But yeah, the Incog definitely has like a special place uh, with me. Yeah, nice dude. Yeah, awesome. I remember seeing that like ages ago. The the, the hoodie one in particular. Um, yeah. And I want to get Matt Wilson on here from Ray Allen as well. Um, I think. Oh, I've you'll seen love him. him a bunch He's a times. sarcastic little asshole. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I get. <laughs> I, I never met him or spoken to him, but I just I watch all his videos and I'm just like, man, I, I see He's a lot a of me in that guy. Is... <laughs> <laughs> you'll have a good time with Matt. Matt's... Matt's actually like, you know, we have a you know, Ray Allen and uh, everyone thinks it's just like a business relationship, but Matt and I are actually very good friends. Um, I, you know, I, tech, I he uh, refuses to answer phone calls because he's a fucking millennial. 
So, so yeah, <laughs> he only wants to do text messages. So I just send him like dirty text messages or like a bunch of voice memos. I'm like, you still have to hear my voice. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get away. No, from yeah, no, you should hit him up for sure. I mean, Matt's a, Matt's a really good guy. And that crew, I mean, the crew at Ray Allen is, you know, they're awesome people. It's actually, they're such a large company. That everyone thinks this is like this massive operation, but in reality, like Matt, Matt's like on the floor, like designing and like sewing stuff as well as doing like everything else that he does too. So that whole crew is like him and Billy and JD and uh, Matt Aiken and all those guys are, you know, they're real people, you know, putting in work. So they're awesome guys. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, they've been around fuck, since 1948 or something, Ray Allen. Yeah. I think uh, what Ted Summers always says is like Ray Allen uh, been around before dogs. Before, <laughs> yeah. before the first dog or something like that so yeah nice man uh dude last i just want to quickly go to instagram and, and just make sure there's a couple of questions here that need to get answered man there's definitely one there um bear with me mate well i get i got this ancient tablet i'm pretty sure the ten commandments are written on this fucking thing <laughs> where's the damn thing there it is Alrighty. Well, one of your guys, um, Pro, uh, Farouk, I think it is. Prom K9 Farouk. Oh, yeah. Sent you some guys. Little, uh, your little love hearts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> mate, D, Decoy Duff. That's a, Actually, that's a mate of mine, previous podcast guest, Josh McDuff. Um, he wants to know about uh, expanding K9 Street League into Australia in the future. Yeah. I mean, the whole I, I, the goal with Street League is to be a world sport. So it's to be a, a completely organized world sport um, where we'll have national, obviously, you know, national titles, national worlds, or national things that actually have like world events. Um, but that's for everywhere. You know, I want to, we want to build this out everywhere because, you know, the scoring, the way that we do street league, you know, the scoring's across the board, the same, um, the decoy requirements are the same. So there's no reason why we can't spread this positive community and culture throughout the world. Yeah, awesome, man. Because I know, like, Josh in particular does PSA, and you know, I've had Pat Stewart on here and stuff. And um, without Just keep up all hole, those big-ass spiders away from me, all those giant spiders and other deadly creatures <laughs> you guys got in Australia. Dude, every now and then I'll post, like, a story to my Instagram account of some fucking spider in my warehouse. It's like the size of my hands, man. We I saw one last yeah. night at, on my bedroom window. I was like, I need to get out of this country, man. <laughs> or just firebomb the whole thing or something. I'll, I'll, I'll burn my warehouse down the next time I fucking see a spot. Yeah, I, I keep, every time I think it's uh, Australia, I'm like, man, I was like, it just feels like everything over there wants to kill you or something like that. I was like, can't, uh, can't yeah, mate, we, what, we, what are those spiders called? There's like the ones that are hanging in houses. What are those called? Oh, we've got a bunch, man. There's the, the Huntsman, which is the big ones. The you can see, like, yeah, yeah that, that we get them here. We've got so many, man, in my warehouse. There was one on my chair one day. Like, I'm like, oh, bro. Yeah. Damn. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not a spider dude, man. I've, like, Same. I probably shouldn't say this in the podcast, <laughs> but I've had my missus get, get spiders for me before. <laughs> Same. I'm yeah. not into spiders. <laughs> Yeah, man. But you'll take a bite from, like, the craziest dog ever on the inside of the arm. Oh, suit, so. <laughs> for sure. For sure. We ran, We moved into, we got a bunch of acreage, to, like, with, with the house me and my wife got, like, where there's, like, a bunch of wildlife and stuff here. And, again, like, I'm from Eastside San Jose, which is, like, there's nothing like that. I mean, you might get shot, but, like, you're not going to see no freaking giant spider or a bat or, like, whatever <laughs> else is over here. And I started seeing that stuff here. I'm like, nope. I got to get used to this. I need to acclimate. <laughs> Yeah, you get like your own personal protection canine just for the fucking wildlife. Right, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Hey, dude, I'm going to hit the tip on this um, recording. Keep your chat open, though. Um, and I'll, uh, mate, thanks for coming on, dude. I, I really appreciate your time. And that was a, a massive, there's like 20 different things we could have kept talking about, too. But um, we sort of, we did what we could with the time we got. So thank you so much, man. Hey, thank you, man. Thanks for having me on. And I'm sure you're staying up late or early for me. So appreciate that. Nah, bro. Middle of the day for me. All good. I mean, yeah, thank you, man. Okay, awesome. See you, bro. Thank you. See you. 
Hope you enjoyed that episode of the Origin Canine podcast. Tune in next week for another episode. In the meantime, go to origincanine.com, check out our safe, innovative and built-for-purpose canine equipment.